You know, every time we come to an international student convention, it feels like a celebration. I'm celebrating tonight because I get to be here with you. I'm celebrating because I'm going to be here all week long. And I tell you why it's a celebration for me. Because so many of you I've had the opportunity of seeing in your regional conferences over the years, and sometimes in many of your national conferences in other countries. And I enjoy being where you are and seeing your participation in all of the events. It is a magnificent week for me to be with you. But you know, we celebrate a lot of things. We celebrate birthdays. How many have had a birthday this year? Would you celebrate? <laughs> you say, Brother Steve, everybody has a birthday this year. Not necessarily so. When I was in high school, there was a young man one grade ahead of me. He was born February the 29th. I have had, and this is going to shock you, I have had 63 birthdays. The guy that I was in school with, he's only had 16. And we're the same age. I wonder if there's somebody in our crowd tonight, if there's one person, if there's anybody that has a birthday on February the 29th. If so, say me. There's somebody up there that has a birthday? Okay, wow. Imagine this. They will graduate when they're five. That is a very smart individual. <laughs> hey, we also celebrate, you know, anniversaries of events. There are people who've celebrated anniversaries. He mentioned this morning, what, 40? He's trying to think right now how many it was. 44, Brother Steve says. Anniversaries. We celebrate anniversaries. Hey, but I'm interested in those young people who come to me and say, this is our six-month anniversary. Your six-month anniversary? Yeah, we've known each other. We've liked each other for six months. <laughs> I wonder if there's somebody here tonight. This is our one-day anniversary. We met yesterday. <laughs> we already like each other. <laughs> we might even get married. <laughs> hey, we, we celebrate the, the completion of task. How many seniors are there who are graduating this year? I'm glad you're so happy to be graduating because some of your teachers are graduating, I mean, are happy you're graduating too. <laughs> but we, we celebrate the fact that you have finished the course, this part of your life, and you're moving on. We celebrate that together with you. Hey, there are some weird celebrations. I went on the internet and I typed in weird celebrations around the world. There are some weird celebrations. This one takes place in India. It's called the baby dropping. Have you heard of the baby dropping? They actually take toddlers on the rooftops 30 feet high and throw them off. It's supposed to be good luck. There's a crowd down catching the babies. Can you imagine throwing them off? Good luck, kid. <laughs> Hope somebody catches you. That is a weird celebration. Hey, there's also the celebration of the running of the bulls. That is a weird celebration. Hey, let's go get gored by a bull today. Every year, four to 500 people are injured in the running of the bulls. Weird celebrations. We celebrate victories. How many of you have a favorite sports team? At the count of three, I want you to yell out your favorite sports team, whether it's a college team, whether it's a professional team. One, two, three. I imagine there's some of you who don't have much to celebrate. Your team hasn't won for years. 
But we still cheer for our home team. I lived in San Francisco, California for a number of years. I was in San Francisco when the earthquake took place. Now I realize something today, that was in 89. Most of you weren't even alive in 1989. But that earthquake to me is very real. I was at the World Series. <laughs> That's a strange thing. Because at the World Series, we only play each other. It's interesting to go to other countries. When I'm in South Africa, I went to some of the games, the rugby games, and I noticed they were playing other countries. We play each other, and we call it the World Series. But I was at the World Series. San Francisco was playing Oakland. It was called the Bridge Series. It's an exciting time. I've been to many baseball games, regular season games, but there's nothing like going to a championship game. I mean, it is an electrifying feeling. Everybody's cheering. There's nothing like it to be at a championship game like that. 506, the earthquake happened. I was sitting there in outfield, left field, and everything started shaking. There was a lady sitting beside me. She said, this is bad. I said, oh, you live here. You kind of get used to it. You know, you live in San Francisco. We have a little quake from time to time. But it kept going and kept going and kept going. And finally, I looked at her. You're right. This is bad. <laughs> but the amazing thing happened. When the earthquake stopped, everybody in the stands, I mean a packed stadium, everybody, yeah! I don't know what in the world they were celebrating. I guess it's the fact that we live in San Francisco and we successfully survive earthquakes. We celebrate weird things. But I've been thinking about celebrations and all the things we celebrate. And I think if there's anything that ought to be celebrated with vigor and anything that ought to be celebrated with all of our might, it is the grace of God. And if there's anything that ought to cause us to shout, it's God's grace. If there's any time we ought to bring out all the bands, all the orchestras, with all of their instruments. I mean, imagine, the trumpets are playing, the flutes are playing, the tubas are playing, the vuvuzelas are playing. I mean, every manner of musical instrument, if you call that a musical instrument, every manner of musical instrument that you can think of. And all the choirs and all the voices and the clapping of our hands and the raising of our hands. If there's any time we ought to celebrate, it's celebrating the grace of God. I'm waiting for you to celebrate. Now, what I want you to get the feeling of this evening, I, I, want us to, I want us to consider and I want us to deeply think about what God's grace really does mean. God's grace. The Apostle Paul celebrated God's grace. I want to read a passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It talks about the gospel, and that's my assignment tonight, to highlight and to celebrate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where the gospel is given for us in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse number 1. By the grace of God... Excuse me, I've got to go one more place over here and get where I'm supposed to be. There we are. I'm there now. In verse number one, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, and some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me, the Apostle Paul said, 
as one born out of due time, for I'm the least of the apostles, and I'm not meet to be called an apostle, for I persecuted the church of God. And then verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. What I want you to notice in that verse that is before you, the three times the word grace is highlighted. Look at it again carefully, because these are the three points of our message this evening. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Would you say that with me? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say it again. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Read it together. But his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Say it with me. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Say it again. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I'm going to take these in different order, however. I'm going to use the first grace, then the third grace, then the second grace. So the message is one, three, two. Say it with me. One, three, two. Very important for you to remember. Notice the first phrase. I'm what I am by the grace of God. Notice what he said very carefully. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The Apostle Paul did not like Christians. The Apostle Paul persecuted the church of God. The Apostle Paul considered until the death of Stephen. The Apostle Paul hated the way. He fought against these thoughts. But all of a sudden, on the Damascus Road, all things were changed. He met, by the grace of God, Jesus. And as a result, things changed in his life. All things were passed away. Behold, all things became new. We know the story of Paul in the Bible. We see the vast change that took place in his life. And it took place not because of anything he did. It took place because of God's grace. And that's why Paul celebrates the grace of God. I know Paul's story. I do not know your story. I know my story. I remember when I was in the fourth grade, something very unusual took place at our house. It was a time in Mississippi where things were a little bit chaotic. There was very much unrest in the South in 1963. A man came to our house. He came for other reasons, but he happened to be the pastor of the church that was close to our house. It's an interesting story. His name was Delmar Dennis. You can find his name on the internet very colorful individual. The interesting thing was, he was posing as our pastor. He had been placed there by the government. He was an FBI agent undercover. He came to our house. When he came to our house, he invited myself and my brother, who was two years older than I, to go to church. And for the first time in my life, I went to church. The church that I went to, I found friends there, and basically I spent the rest of my years through elementary school and through high school going to that church, and quite frankly, I never missed church. I went Sunday morning, I went Sunday night, I went Wednesday night. I tell people this, the best thing I got out of church, I became a very good ping pong player, because that's all we would do on Sunday night or Wednesday night, we'd play ping pong after the service, and sometimes stay till midnight. But I stayed at that church, all through those years and was very consistent in church attendance. But I knew nothing about the gospel. 
I had never responded to the gospel. To my knowledge, I had no idea if I had even ever heard the gospel, even though I was at that church. I liked the pastors who came to our church. I used to go to youth camp. And there was one man at youth camp I just fell in love with. His name was Weber Walker. I liked him. I wanted to be like him. And so one night at that youth camp, I went forward and I knelt at the altar and I said, I, I think God wants me to be a preacher. I went to Bible college. I didn't know anything about the gospel. I felt like I was doing good works. I felt like I had chosen a good occupation. That's all I looked at it, as an occupation. I was a freshman in college. There was a church that needed someone to fill in. So I drove from Orangeburg, South Carolina to Timmonsville, South Carolina, and I spoke at that church. They asked, can you come back next week as well? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I drove back the next week. I'm 18 years old in Bible college, and I'm speaking at this church. They asked the following Sunday, can you continue to come till we find a pastor? I said, sure, I'll be glad to. So I drove back and forth to that church for the next five years. I became their pastor. And I use that term very loosely. I became their pastor from the time I was 18 years old. I was very immature. And I want to remind you of something. I didn't even know what the gospel was. But I was a good person and I was doing very good works. I remember one time there was a couple in our church, they were having marital problems and they came to me for counseling. I was 19 years old. I sent them down the road to another church. Maybe they could help them. He couldn't help them either. A friend of mine by the name of Tom Lancaster, he was leaving the denomination that we were in, moving to Memphis, Tennessee to start a church. And he had known me for quite a while. He said, Steve, would you come with me to Memphis, Tennessee to be my youth pastor and music man and help us start the church? And so I moved with him at that time to Memphis, Tennessee. There's a reason why I tell you my story. Because it was in Memphis, Tennessee that first year when evangelist Dick Seaton came to our church. And as he came to the church, he preached a message that night called Life's Most Embarrassing Moments. When you stand before God thinking everything is okay and then hearing those words, sorry, I never knew you. <laughs> what do you mean you never knew me? I mean, after all, I I've been preaching. After all, I've been in church all my life. I've been doing good works. What do you mean you never knew me? I became convinced that night as he was preaching and as he talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and as he talked about the matter of salvation, where we're to come to him and simply believe that what he did through his death, burial, and resurrection is sufficient for the forgiveness of our sin and for the hope of eternal life, I realized I had never done that. I sat on the platform and I thought, my soul... Here I've been in church all my life, and, and here I, I've been in, quote, the ministry. Here I've gone to Bible college. After he preached that message, it was a few days after that, I said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I said, you have no idea what's been going through my heart and my mind since I heard the message, life's most embarrassing moment. And the best thing I can tell you, I'm just as lost as I can be. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, Steve, let's settle that right now. In 5599 Flowering Peach, Memphis, Tennessee, I got down on my knees and I trusted Christ. Now I'll tell you why I tell you the story. I believe that it was God's grace that brought Delmar Dennis to my house when I was in the fourth grade. Even though he was posing as a pastor and even though he was in our community for other reasons, I believe that was the grace of God putting me on the path that I needed to be on. 
I believe that it was the grace of God that I was in the church that I was in because I was walking a path at that point. I believe it's the grace of God that sent me to the Bible college. I believe it's the grace of God that sent me to the church. I believe it's the grace of God that brought Tom Lancaster into my life. I believe it's the grace of God when we moved to Memphis, Tennessee that I had the opportunity of being at the right place at the right time when Dick Seaton came to preach the message and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It is all because it was God's grace. That's the reason I celebrate God's grace, because I know I'm saved. But what does it mean? It means I will never stand before God as a result of my sin and give an account for the sin because it's all under the blood of Jesus Christ, blotted out as a thick cloud, removed from as far as the east is from the west. The sin is gone, taken care of at the cross of Calvary, and that's because of the grace of God. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, don't miss the word, for by grace, say the word with me, grace, say it again, grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift, say that word, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God has graced us with a gift, and that gift is eternal life. That gift is the forgiveness of sin. And what a marvelous gift God has given us. Hey, someone says there's a wonderful acrostic for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I like to simplify things. You know what I think grace is? God. Grace is God. And it's God giving us what we could never earn or what we could never buy. He's willing to give grace to everyone. The Bible tells us that there's a measure of grace given to every individual. God's grace. Bobby Finch and I, a number of years ago, were at the 50th anniversary of Awana Clubs International. There was a man who was speaking that night, and he was talking about the wonderful grace of God. And he used illustrations that I've never forgotten. A man had called from prison. He was in prison serving a life sentence because of multiple rapes. He had heard this radio preacher talk about the forgiveness of God and God's gift of salvation. He wrote a letter to that pastor. He said, I don't see how God could ever forgive me. He said, I realize the things that I've done and the things that, that I'm in prison for. I realize these things were horrible things. God could never forgive me. That radio pastor wrote a letter back to him that I think was a marvelous letter. In his letter he said, we all go down various roads of life. When I go down my road, I notice there are ruts in my road, ruts that have been placed there as a result of my sin. When I look down my road, I see the ruts. When I look down your road, there are ruts there as well. Granted, the ruts in your road might be a bit deeper than the ruts in my road. But every one of us who've traveled our road have ruts in our road that have been placed there as a result of sin. But a wonderful thing happens when it snows. When the snow begins to fall, it covers the roads of both of our lives, so that when you look down each of the roads, they look exactly the same. And the Bible says, though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be as white as snow, and God covers all of our sin. He used a second illustration by taking two books. One book, I'll put my name in its place, The Life and Times of Steve Piggott. Open that book and read the pages, page after page. It doesn't look so good. I mean, page after page, there's sin. Page after page, there are things there that are not so good. 
page after page throughout my life full of ungodliness. He took another book, and on the cover, The Life and Times of Jesus Christ, you open that book, and page after page after page, you see the righteousness of God. What a wonderful book on every page. Then he said this, you know what God did for you? God took all the contents from your book, and he took everything out of the book, and he took the contents from his book and slid them inside your book. So now when you open the cover of your book, Life and Times of Steve Piggott, all you see is now the righteousness of God. Understand something. I am not righteous, but I'm made righteous through Jesus Christ, and that's the grace of God. You are not righteous, but you are made righteous through Jesus Christ, and that's the grace of God. And we ought to celebrate the fact that we can have a righteous life because of God's grace, celebrating the grace of God. I don't know your story, but I would say this. It's the grace of God that has you in the church you're in. It's the grace of God that has you on the path your own. It's the grace of God. You may not have ever considered it. It's the grace of God that has you in the Christian school that you're in. It's the grace of God that has around you monitors and teachers. It's the grace of God that have those people that love you. That's the grace of God. You may have responded and may have trusted Christ as your Savior, and you've experienced the grace of God. But if you've not, if you've not trusted Christ, you're on the right path. God is seeking you. Let him find you. He came to seek and save that which was lost. God's amazing grace, grace so amazing, is with me each day. For his great love, I could never, never, ever repay. So for one last time, for those of you who know Jesus Christ, for those of you who've been forgiven of your sin, for those of you who know you have eternal life because you received Jesus Christ, would you right now celebrate the fact that you are a child of God? We do not, nor will we ever deserve what we have been given. But I want you to notice the second thing. From our verse, we go down to the last part of the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, what is Paul? He's a child of God now. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was spoken upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And here's our second point. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That's an amazing statement. Paul, hey boy, you are an amazing individual. Paul, you must have a lot of ability to, to get people to, to accomplish tasks. I mean, after all, you've put together groups of people to make missions trips, and, and you must be a wonderful speaker and have the power to influence people. For so many people have come to Christ as a result of your mission trip. And by the way, you've started churches. And man, you've done a masterful job. I think Paul's first remark would be as this passage. Oh, you don't understand. It's not me. It's the grace of God. God has graced me with the abilities to do the things that have been done. So tonight, I want you to look at grace in a different way. God has graced so, so many people in this auditorium by giving you gifts. 
God has graced many of you with gifts of music. I've had the opportunity of hearing so many of you in your performance, playing the piano, playing musical instruments. I've heard you sing. I've seen your artwork. I've seen many of you who have talents with your hands that you can make things. Understand, that is the grace of God. You say, well, Brother Steve, I have worked hard at playing the piano. No, 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 understand something. I worked hard at it too, and I can't play a single thing today because it's not my gift. You have been gifted. Now, granted, we ought to perfect the gift. Granted, we ought to work at the gift, but the ability that you have to play the piano, have you ever stopped to think that you ought to thank God because he's graced you with this ability to play the piano? You ought to thank God that he's graced you with the ability to sing. You ought to thank God that he's graced you with the ability in art to draw, to paint. I can't draw a straight line. I want you to realize tonight that you have gifts that have been given to you by God and it's because of God's grace. It's not natural talent. It's a gift from God. Romans chapter 12 verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. It's God who graces you with the ability to do the things that you do. I think of Danny Thomas, and I think, wow, what a grace. I, I think of Bobby Fish, I say, wow, what grace that God gave these men the talents they have. I wonder, have you ever come to the place where a child of God, you say, Lord, I want to get on my knees and I want to thank you for gifts that you have given me. It's of God. No need to be haughty, no need to be proud regarding your ability. Because it's God's gift, we ought to humbly thank God for the gift that he has given us. What is your gift? What is it that God has gifted you with? What is it that God wants you to use to make a difference in this world? He's graced you. So you know what I think we ought to do? I think we ought to celebrate the fact that God has gifted us through his grace with the ability of doing the things that he has given us to do. Would you celebrate the grace that God has given you? If you can play the piano, celebrate it. And I'll tell you this, there are many in this room like me, you can't play a musical instrument at all. There are many in this room like me, you wouldn't want me to sing. There are many in this room, we don't have the abilities that you have, but I tell you what I like doing, I like celebrating the abilities that God has given you because it's all of God. Everything we have is of God. The air I breathe, the water I drink, the clothes I wear, the house I live in, everything I have, it's God-given. We need to consider and thank Him. But then I come to the point of my message, the third point. Go back to our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Notice that phrase. His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Interesting statement. Because it seems to indicate that God's grace sometimes is given in vain. But Paul said, the grace that was given to me was not in vain. And I started working and I labored more abundantly than they all. It was not given in vain. I need someone to come help me. Brother Ballinger, would you mind coming, sir, and, and help me and stand here for a minute? I've chosen you because you look like you would fit the part very well. He is going to represent a multi-billionaire. There's something about him. I'm going to call him your benefactor. Your benefactor. 
You say, what do you mean by that? Well, when you have a benefactor, that's someone who supplies things that you might need. You benefit from that individual. Your benefactor wants to give you one million dollars every single year for the rest of your life. This is your benefactor, and I want you to start collecting that tonight from him. Every one of you, he's your benefactor. Imagine this. Imagine if this were presented to you. You have such a benefactor who can take care of all your needs and all your wants for as long as you live. And he says this, if you need more, I'll give more. All you have to do is ask. Now, how many of you would take that offer? Would you hold your hand in the air and you say, oh yeah, I would take that offer. How many of you would celebrate if you really had that offer? Imagine this. Imagine someone in this group would say, I would not be interested in that at all. But he's offering a free gift. Offer your gift. The gift is here. One million dollars every year. Collect the first tonight. And anything else you have need of, it's right here. All you have to do is come and get it. I'm not interested. I have no desire. Now, I want you to help me with this. What would you say of that individual? You would say, that individual is a, and you fill in the word. Are you ready? At the count of three, tell me, that individual is a. <laughs> Some of you use words I can't use right now. They are not politically correct. I would say this. Someone who would not take that offer would be rather foolish. Would you agree? But let me change our benefactor. No longer is it our multi-billionaire. You can have a seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Murderer. Imagine our benefactor is the Lord. And Jesus stands. And Jesus says this. I want to give you abundant life while you're living. For abundant life is in Jesus Christ. And I not only want to give you abundant life, I want to give you the forgiveness of your sin. And I want to give you a home in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. A benefactor who's a multi-billionaire has no comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. What he offers, he offers just for our lifetime. But what Jesus offers is for all of eternity. I think sometimes the grace of God is frustrated. Sometimes the grace of God is ignored. Sometimes the grace of God is pushed away. Even though some might be on the path, even though some might be in church, even though some might be in school, they reject the grace of God that is offered over and over and over and over again. And I would say of that individual, that is unwise. This afternoon, after they had practiced all the opening, I walked through all the bleachers. I went through every state. I went through every country. And I prayed as I walked through and I said, Lord, may your grace be in this section tonight again. Your grace has come to some, but it's been pushed away and they've ignored it. They frustrated the grace of God and they've said no to it and they pushed it aside. But Lord, would your grace come to this individual again tonight and draw that person to yourself? For the child of God this evening, God's graced you with gifts that would make a difference. But could I ask this evening as a child of God, are you using the gift that God has given you for the praise and honor and glory of his name? Or sometimes the gift that is given, we push it aside. We don't exercise the gift. We don't try to make the gift any better. We don't try to honor the Lord or glorify the Lord with it. We frustrate the grace of God when God has given us wonderful gifts. 
I believe it's a right and proper thing for the child of God to come and kneel before God and say, God, I so thank you for the gift, and I want to commit that I want to exercise this gift, and I want to take this gift that you've given me and bring glory and honor to your name in any way that I possibly can so that I do not frustrate the grace of God that has been given to me. God's graced us. It's all of grace. And so in just a moment, I'm going to ask us to close our eyes and bow our heads, and I want you to consider, are you frustrating the grace of God? I had put off salvation over and over again until finally one day I said yes. May you not frustrate His grace tonight. He stands with open arms. Listen, it's God's grace. You're going through any difficulty, you're going through any problems, His grace is sufficient, the Bible says. Having problem with sin in your life, the Bible says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God's grace is greater than all. And I've prayed for God's grace to be in this room tonight. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.